afternoon or good evening, depending on where people are. Let's try screen sharing. I am doing that. I am looking for the button. You'd think I'd remember how to do this by now. This is always happening. There's, it never gets old. In the meanwhile, if someone is interested in our freestyle conversation on the topic, check out the API, the Docs podcast. And this is going to be the formal way. <laughs> a little bit different, uh, I hope. Take it away. I hope this is a little more organized. So yes, hi, I am Ilona Corin Deutsch. I have recently just joined a company, a startup called Nuna, uh, where I am doing content. And I will be working on a doc site in a developer portal. So I've been trying to get my thoughts organized for that. So you're kind of um, listening to me getting my thoughts together and presenting ideas and research. And I am trying to remember how to go to the next slide. Okay, the W3C on accessibility points out that the web is fundamentally designed to work for all people, whatever their hardware, software, language, culture, location, or physical or mental ability. When the web meets this goal, it's accessible to people with a diverse range of hearing, movement, sight, and cognitive ability. That's what this is about. Your developer portal is fundamentally a website, and so it is very important to follow accessibility rules if you really want to be open for the whole community. My working definition of a developer portal is that it's the interface between API producers and the API community. This interface enables developers to register, explore, consume, and get support for your API. And it includes not just documentation, but forums, blogs, tutorials, and lifecycle information. And all of this really needs to be accessible. So in 2020, accessibility should be obvious, but sadly, it's not when you look at all the developer portals out there. For many people, technology makes things easier. For people with disabilities, technology makes things possible. Accessibility means developing content to be as accessible as possible, no matter an individual's abilities and no matter how they access the web. And what disabilities are we, are we talking about? Well, first of all, they could be permanent or temporary. And, this, and these abilities can affect use of your portal. We're looking at auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical, speech, and visual um, varying abilities. Finally, accessibility is actually for everybody because it can also benefit people without disabilities. For example, users who are on a small screen or changing abilities due, due to aging. I can tell you that when I was a lot younger, I didn't wear glasses to read my screen. You might have a temporary situation like a broken arm or lost glasses. I actually own about 15 pairs of glasses. They're all over my apartment for that reason. If I didn't have any of them, my monitor would be a lot. I would have things magnified a lot. You could have situational limitations like bright sunlight or lots of background noise. And you could have users that have slow internet connections or limited or expensive bandwidth. This is especially important if you're trying to reach a global audience. And finally, accessibility is the law. The W3C maintains a list of relevant laws and policies by country. This is the link to that, which you'll have when I show the presentation. I know that the EU and the US have some of the strictest accessibility laws in the world, but I think every country where somebody is at this conference has a law. So more details. When you talk about the principles of accessible content, they talk about poor. Perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Perceivable means that the information and the components must be presentable to users in a way they can um, notice them and use them. Operatable means, uh, operable, excuse me, users must be able to control the UI elements um, no matter how they access them. Uh, buttons have to be clickable, understandable. Contents must be comprehensible to users and robust. It should be strong enough to withstand challenges and changing standards. The parts of your website that need to be accessible, navigation, links, focus date, forms, images, sliders, 
multimedia, tables, iframes, maps, infographics, text layouts, fonts, colors, page structure, and documentation. In other words, every part of your website or your developer and your developer portal. Let's talk a little bit about color. Text foreground and background colors need to be chosen so that they pass color contrast tests. The purpose of contrast is that allowing people to see and distinguish different parts of an interface. Color is an important factor in this context, but it has clear limitations. You can't lay on color alone. Light gray ne should never be used. It doesn't contrast well enough with any background. And for buttons, the text color must contrast against the button background color. There are several free apps and websites to help you choose contrasting color palettes or test what you have. The reason I did not put the numbers for contrast in here is that different countries have different laws about what they should be. You also want to avoid color as your only cue. Um, don't have forms that say required fields are in red. For example, some people don't see red or they use a screen reader where there's no color at all. You can check your contrast by doing something quilters do when we, when we make a pattern or, or look at our fabrics together. Check your contrast by converting to grayscale. Then you can really see the difference between dark, light, and middle. The text link contrast ratio I have in here is the US law. I apologize for the focus, but that's the one I've had to learn. And you don't want to use color as the main way to deliver information. Again, not everybody sees every color or any color at all. Uh, about links, you have to have your links visually distinguishable from surrounding non-link text. Again, kind of repeating myself here, but color must not be the only way to determine a link unless an additional underline or something is provided when the link receives focus. If a link downloads a file, you need to include text to indicate that and the file type to be downloaded. So, you know, no click here, but also this is going to download a PDF. Um, you need link text meaning to be meaningful. And you can check that by, when you read it aloud, does it make sense? You don't say click here. And by the way, meaningful link text also helps SEO. Okay, use the ARIA labeled by attribute to associate a read more link with the title of the article linked to. Um, the, the ARIA labeled by attribute establishes relationships between objects and their labels. Assistive technology like screen readers use this attribute to catalog objects in a document. Um, you can read a lot more about that on mozilla.org and I have a link in the speaker's notes so they'll be there when I share my slides. You wanna provide skip links and skip to navigation links to allow keyboard users to navigate directly to the content they wanna see. You, have to, you need to inform users what a link will take them off site. And also remember that mobile devices and touch screens do not have a hover state. So you don't want to convey important information only by hovering. For anybody unfamiliar with skip links, um, they allow users to skip links such as um, skip to content or skip to main content, just something like that. Okay, lots and lots of stuff about images. All text should be concise, alt text, excuse me, should be concise and, and no more than 250 characters. Never say image of, graphic of, or picture of in the alt description. It's obvious it's a picture. Um, image links should describe the image link, the link destination for screen readers. Use images to illustrate rather than provide new information. Flowcharts and screen captures need the alt attribute. Um, use text rather than images of text for code samples. It's, it's funny to me how many people don't do that. In addition to it um, not being readable by a screen reader, if it's an image, um, translators will need the text anyway. When possible, use a scalable image and upload a larger version of each image that users can easily access. Other media. Some of this is really easy to do. Close caption your videos, and they must provide transcribed dialogue, narration, and other meaningful sounds. So if there's music playing, if you've ever turned on closed captioning on your TV or been to a movie with, with subtitles, it'll say music playing. You want that. It's really cool if you want to have them sign language interpreted. That is not required by law, but people like it, even people who don't read sign because it's fun. It's catchy. 
you need to provide the transcript of podcasts. And you always need a method to pause, stop, or turn off automatically playing media content. White space is important too. And ironically, I'm telling you this in a very crowded slide. White space helps divide information into logical groupings. You wanna break up large sections of text, use white space liberally, separate paragraphs, create headings, use lists when you can. And never force a line break within a sentence or a paragraph. It might look really good in the language you write it in, but when translated, it might look really bad. Or if somebody resizes a window or enlarges text, it could blow up too. So notes for screen readers. If, if you properly code a link, a screen reader will say it's a link. Um, screen reader users often listen to links out of context, either by navigating through the links or using a keyboard command to list all the links on the page. So because of that, make sure your links make sense out of context. Skip links again help screen reader users jump over navigation menus to get directly to the main content each time a new page loads. Otherwise, the page is read from the top all over again. And skip links are also important for users who don't use a screen reader but do use a keyboard rather than a mouse. And some more about screen readers. A properly coded button is announced in a screen reader as a button. And form, forms need buttons to be activated on screen readers. Programmatically determine the human language of your site. This will help the screen reader pronounce text correctly. And for example, if you might have a phrase in another language in your content, programmatically determine that. And if you have a non-text content, again, we're talking about images, videos, other multimedia, it needs a text alternative. Content structure. And I realize I'm talking really fast, but I'm trying to get through my whole presentation here. Text size must be reasonable and easy to see. Nowadays, the current stand, it's not a standard, but the current thing people are doing seems to be that navigation link text is usually between 16 and 18 pixels and regular content between 14 and 16 pixels. In languages that go left to right, other than the header, header section, content should be left aligned. This is helpful for dyslexic users poor users with poor eyesight and also we read left to right when you when you um justify on the right you add really weird spacing and it can be hard on people's eyes and never remove the ability to magnify fonts on mobile devices people will leave a site if it's too small on their phone and they can't make your text bigger every page needs a title the first heading should be an H1, use consecutive headings and don't skip hierarchical levels and use landmarks to designate content areas. You could do that with HTML5 or with ARIA and the source page of an iframe must have a valid meaningful title attribute. Finally, we could, since we're text writers in here, some of us, let's talk about writing for accessibility. Accessible language, um, you want to improve readability, use concise language, write short paragraphs, and again, create lists where you can rather than paragraphs and long sentences with commas. Define your terminology and expand acronyms the first time you use them. You might, you might use a term, you might use an acronym at work all the time and you think it's obvious and it's not may not be obvious to a new user or even a user that hasn't been to your site in a while. When I say use technical language, I mean use the most specific word you can to talk about technical concepts and processes. For example, don't say take when you mean copy or clone and don't say put when you mean install. You wanna use inclusive language. Inclusivity to me is part of accessibility and accessibility is part of inclusivity. I just don't know how you could do one without the other. You wanna use gender neutral pronouns. You write in the second person when possible. You're talking to your users anyway, not about them. If for some reason you can't use the third person plural, that means in English, say they rather than he or she. It may feel awkward at first. It's actually a structure that goes back to the Middle Ages. You want to avoid ableist language. Phrases such as like, you can see this or um, no, I'm blind, I can't see this. You also want to avoid directional language. Um, not the above table, but the previous table. Previous and following instead of above and below is kind of 
when that really gets gets to me. But if someone's on a screen reader, above and below doesn't mean anything. If they're not scrolling, if above and below doesn't mean anything. Don't use location specific metaphors. Americans have trouble remembering that not everybody plays baseball. Hit it out of the park doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, strike three doesn't necessarily mean anything. Likewise, jokes can go horribly wrong when translated, so just skip them. <laughs> you also want to use unnecessarily violent languages and images. Um, I came from working in gaming, so this was a really important issue. It may have nothing to do with your product, and you're lucky there. Um, be sensitive to your word choices. You probably never mean to use product um, problematic language, but it can happen. You want to avoid words and phrases like crazy, insane, lame, blind to, look out for. I have the link in my notes. Art Autistic Hoya has a comprehensive list of terms to avoid and alternate words to use. Avoid using socially charged terms for technical concepts. Avoid master slave, blacklist, whitelist, native feature, first class citizen. Even if other companies are still using these terms, set a standard. Instead of master slave, try primary replica or primary and secondary. Instead of blacklist, whitelist, try deny list and allow list. Use the best term for your context, but that doesn't have social issues. You want to eliminate condescending language too. Statements like just install or simply do or it's easy to are actually exclusionary. Who is this easy for? Who is it simple for? These kind of statements reveal assumptions you're making about your re the readers of your documentation and they create the image of an ideal user. This excludes people who interpret them to mean that they are in some way not skilled enough or smart enough to use your content or your technology. There are a number of online tools you can use to flag language that can be seen as not inclusive. I personally like Alex, uh, that's alex.js. And finally, just ask people, um, hey, can I say this? Hey, is this offensive? Uh, people might be in the category you're asking about, or they might not be, they might just have experience, but it's a good way to get answers. And nobody's gonna get mad at you for asking, they're gonna be glad you tried. So my final summary is accessible and inclusive design is never finished. There is never a moment when you relax because it's perfect and you always need to keep educating yourself. If it's not accessible, it's not acceptable as the sticker says. Thank you very much. And should you want to contact me, here's all my info. And do we have any questions? Thank you, Ilana. I don't see uh, questions in the chat at this moment, uh, but we do have three minutes left. Um, I would like to ask you about um, how you see the connection between accessibility as a technical requirement and inclusivity as a, a general notion from everybody involved in this. Um, do they go hand in hand? And what can you do with uh, when you are setting up your team to make this sort of an instinctive reaction? Well, part of being inclusive is being accessible. That's you know obvious. You're not inclusive if somebody with a disability can't use your can't use your portal. Likewise, you're not, it doesn't feel acceptable if you're excluded. Accessible, excuse me. It doesn't feel accessible if you're excluded. Like, if you can't use a, a site, that's, that's exclusionary rather than inclusive. So to, they're, they're really very joined to me. When you, when you set up a team, have trainings. There are really good organizations out there that specifically do trainings on this subject. Build your team, build your company in a way that it's everybody's job, but don't just pay lip service to it's everybody's job. If you have the budget to have, have someone at your company, if there's someone is an accessibility PM, for example, or you have an accessibility team, get them involved when you're building your developer portal. 
if you're not sure how to do accessible design, someone on your UX team might know how. So it's fundamentally involved experts if you don't know and keep learning. I have a feeling that the same what we have heard uh, from um, Corgi Bytes on how internal communications happen uh, is then uh, has a ripple effect on the output. I think that's uh, also true for, for the mindset. I think so, yes. Thank you very much, Ilona. Um, just uh, in case, could you also uh, put your information in the chat for uh, those who may not be able to save it from the slides? And I'm asking our next